Mr. Levin, Mr. Levin, no. Ms. Landrew, Ms. Landrew, no. Mr. Reed of Nevada, Mr. Reed of Nevada, no.
On this vote, the yeas are 64, the nays are 36. Under the previous order requiring 60 votes for the adoption of this amendment, the amendment is agreed to. Under the previous order, amendments 217 and 184 offered by the senator from Oklahoma are agreed to. Mr. President. The majority leader. I ask that we now proceed to a period of morning business. Some is allowed to speak for up to 10 minutes each during this period of morning business. Without objection. Mr. President, the budget that we've talked about so much. Mr. President, this budget that we've spent so much time talking about is really about making tough choices, hard choices, difficult choices. The American people understand this. They understand tough choices. They have to make them every day, especially now, with the economy being in the shape it's in. So should our, their representatives in Congress make tough choices. We're being honest with ourselves over here, Mr. President. We know that we can't get 100% of what we want. That's what this negotiation is all about. That's why this is a negotiation. It's not a winner-take-all. Democrats have made tough choices because we want to get this agreement finished. We want it completed. We want to keep the country running and keep the momentum of an economy that's now creating jobs. We want to avoid a shutdown and the terrible consequences that would follow. The only thing Republicans are trying to avoid is making the tough choices that we need to make. We've been more than reasonable, Mr. President more than fair. We meet them halfway, they say no. We meet them more than halfway, they still say no. We meet them all the way, they still say no. If Republicans were serious about keeping the country running, all they would have to do is say yes. And now we learn that House Republicans are going to make another excuse, create another diversion, and avoid another tough choice. Instead of solving the crisis the way we should, instead of saying yes, they're say in fact what they're going to do is pass what, we, what they'll call another short-term stopgap measure. They'll say it's short-term, but what that really means, it's a shortcut, a shortcut around doing our jobs. Instead of solving problems, they're stalling or procrastinating. That's not just bad policy, it's a fantasy. We all heard the President of the United States say yesterday that he won't accept anything short of a full solution. And why should he? We're six months into the fiscal year now, Mr. President. President Obama is right. We can't keep funding our great country with one stopgap after another. The United States of America, this great country of ours, shouldn't have to live paycheck to paycheck. We're not going to give up. We're going to keep talking and keep trying to find middle ground. The Speaker and I will go back to the White House tonight, two hours and 20 minutes. We'll meet with him again, continue the conversation we've been having for weeks with this administration. We know the Republicans are afraid of the Tea Party. That's been established, Mr. President. Now it looks like they're also afraid of making the tough choices we have to make. But tough choices are what governing is all about. They're what leadership's all about. It's time for my friends in the House of Representatives to stop campaigning and start governing. And remember what one of the greatest speakers of all time said. In fact, he was speaker three times, Mr. President. It's from the state of Kentucky. Henry Clay, he was known as the great compromiser. And he said that all legislation is based on mutual consensus. That's what this is all about. But remember, let's focus on the word mutual. It takes both of us. Mr. President, it's time to leave. I would note the absence of corn. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka.
President. The Senator from Maryland. I ask unanimous consent that the quorum call be dispensed with. Without objection. Mr. President, I just want to spend a moment or two talking about how devastating it would be for our country and for the people of our country if, in fact, we have a government shutdown. Now, I know I represent Maryland, and there are a lot of federal workers in Maryland, and they're very concerned because it will affect them. But a government shutdown will affect everyone in this country. It will affect people who depend upon their government being there to serve them. If you're depending upon a timely IRS refund check and government is shut down and you need that money and counting on it, it's your money, well, you may find out if government is shut down, there's no one to talk to, and that check will be delayed. Or if you're a person who's entitled to Social Security disability payments and you have a case that's pending, there's not going to be there, people there to, to resolve those cases, and you're going to have to wait. And that could very well affect your ability uh, to literally pay your bills. Or if you're doing research at NIH, cutting-edge research, which depends upon the continuity of the work in order to discover the answers to many of the problems we face in health care, well, that's going to be disrupted if we have a shutdown in government. The bottom line is that everyone loses if we have a shutdown of our government on Friday. The taxpayers lose. Study after study shows that a shutdown of government will actually cost the taxpayers more money. It makes no sense at all. And yet there are some on the, in the House that said, look, bring a shutdown on. They're not negotiating in good faith. They're saying it's our way or we're not going to do it. Basically, they want to shut down the government. Well, we need to negotiate in good faith. It's not going to be what the Democrats want. It's not going to be what the Republicans want. That's how the system works. You've got to negotiate in good faith. I know that our leaders are doing that. I would just urge all of us to understand the consequences of a shutdown and make sure that we take steps to negotiate in good faith to have a budget agreement completed by Friday of this week. I just really want my colleagues understand why people in my state should be very concerned about the budget that passed the House of Representatives, the Republican budget. It would hurt children with, on Head Start. In my own state of Maryland, 1,795 children on Head Start would, be, would lose their ability to go to the Head Start program. We know how important that is to our country. For students in Maryland, they would find that their Pell Grants would be reduced by almost $700. Women would be hurt by the loss of essential preventive health services. Families would be at risk of the lack of enforcement of our regulatory bills that protect us from uh, on public health issues. Uh, and the list goes on and on. Uh, it's been estimated that 700,000 jobs would be lost if the House budget became real. 700,000 jobs would jeopardize our recovery. And as you know, we're just starting to see job growth. We certainly don't want to take steps that would be counterproductive to this. And as we pointed out many times, the, the budget that the House sends us over is, is concentrating on 12 percent of federal spending, 12 percent. We need to broaden this discussion, and we all understand that. But it starts with allowing the political system to work and for us to get together and reach an agreement to, for the budget that is already six months we're into. We're talking about the last six months of the budget that we're working on. In my own state of Maryland, if the House budget were to pass, the Metro would lose $150 million. And this is, of course, the nation's transit system. So people would find that if the transit system can't operate, uh, the, the, the commute into to work would take a lot longer, our roads are going to get clogged, it's not what we need for this nation. And I guess my point to you is this. The House budget, the Republican budget, is not going to become law. It's not what the Republicans want. It's not what the Democrats want. We've got to come together. We've got to, 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 and we're doing that. But let's not let a minority in the House tell us that we're not going to let the system work for the best interests of the American people. Now, I think, though, we should be very concerned about whether this is part of a plan 
with the Republicans when we take a look at their budget for next year, the 2012 budget, which was released this week. There's some very disturbing signs as to what their intentions are all about. We saw it with their budget for this year. Now we see that continued with their budget for next year. They, they literally want to turn the Medicare system into a voucher program where seniors are going to have to rely upon private insurance companies. And we tried that before Medicare. In the early 1960s, the, the number of seniors that couldn't get health care insurance was staggering. Why? Because private insurance companies are not interested in insuring people who make claims. The older you are, the more you're going to make claims on our health care system. If seniors are at the mercy of private insurance companies, it's going to be much more expensive for seniors, and they're not going to get the adequate protections that they need. We understand that. That's a reason why we should all be concerned about the budget that was brought out this week. The Medicaid system that protects our most vulnerable and protects our seniors. Seniors rely in large part on the Medicaid system to deal with long-term care, nursing care. The Republican budget would transfer that to the states with a block grant making it very unlikely that we would see the continuation of the program that is critically important, not just to people who are vulnerable, but if they have to rely again on use of emergency rooms in order to get care, it's going to be more expensive for all of us. These short-term so-called budget savings turn into long-term costs for our country. But then the Republican budget continues to do these domestic discretionary cuts, well beyond what we need as a nation to grow. Taking again our most vulnerable, those who depend upon government, making college education more expensive, denying young people the, the opportunities that they need is continued. But guess what's missing in the Republican budget? Guess what's missing? There's no effort to really deal with the revenue problems of America. Now I say there's a better way to do this, and there's 64 senators who have come together and say, look, We've got to deal with our national debt. We've got to deal with it with a credible budget plan, a credible budget plan that starts with, the, with discretionary spending cuts, and we all agreed to that. We've got to put the military, reduce military spending. We've got to deal with mandatory spending, but we also have to deal with the revenue side. That's 32 Democrats, 32 Republican senators have said that. That's what we need to do. The Republican budget in the House doesn't take us down that path. It's not a credible plan for dealing with the budget deficit that can pass and be enacted and give confidence not only to the financial markets here in America, but around the world and tell the American people that they're putting their interests first. So I just really want my colleagues to understand we don't want to jeopardize the, the, the recovery. We want to get our budget into balance, and we've got to get this year's budget behind us. We've got to deal with it. President Obama was right when he said in his State of the Union address that we've got to beat our competition. We've got to educate, out innovate, and out build. And we've got to do it in a fiscally responsible way. We can do that if we work together now and, con and deal with the budget that we're currently in that ends on September 30th of this year in a fiscally responsible way. The dollar budget cuts we've all agreed to. We know what it's going to be. Now let's get this done and move on and work together for the sake of our nation. I am convinced that if we work together, we can have a responsible plan and we certainly should not allow a minority in the House to block a budget resolution for this year causing a government shutdown. That's the worst case for the American people. And I urge our colleagues to continue to work together so that we can keep government operating, reduce the deficit, and allow America to grow and compete to meet the challenges of the future. And with that, Mr. President, I would uh, yield the floor and suggest the absence of a quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka.
Thank you, Mr. President. I ask on unanimous consent to dispense with the roll call. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, and I ask unanimous consent that we now resume consideration of S-493, set aside the pending amendments so that I may call up the following two amendments in block. That would be Cardin 240 and Snow 253. Without objection, the clerk will report. Senator from Louisiana, Ms. Landrieu, proposes unblock amendments number 240 and 253. Mr. President, I ask consent the Senate proceed to a period of morning business with senators permitted to speak up to 10 minutes each. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. President. I want to thank Senator Cardin for his patience um, and Senator Snow as we've worked uh, through the last uh, hour or two on their two proposals. Both of them have to do with perfecting our contracting programs. While not specific to the SBIR program and STTR program, they are very relevant to the work that we do on the Small Business Committee. So I really appreciate all the members that allowed these two amendments to go forward. They'll be pending, and hopefully tomorrow we can get some agreement on some additional votes. We've had a very busy day today, as you know, on the underlying bill, the SBIR bill. We voted on about seven amendments. Uh, we've had some very uh, heated discussions on issues that are actually not at all related to this bill, but are very important to this body. And I thank the senators for working in good faith as we try to move through the many amendments that have been filed, most of which are not germane to the issue at hand, but are important to be discussed uh, on the floor of the Senate and here in Congress. So I want to thank particularly Senator Cardin. I noticed that he's on the floor. He may want to say a word uh, now about his amendment just briefly, and I commit to the Senator that we'll try to call his amendment up and Senator Snow's amendment as soon as we can uh, tomorrow. But I yield the floor. Mr. President. Senator from Maryland. Uh, let me thank Senator Landrieu for her extraordinary work and patience. You give, you give us credit. We give you credit for patience on the, the manner in which this legislation has been considered. This bill is very important to not just the small business community, but to our economy. We are talking about providing the wherewithal for innovation in America. Small businesses will produce the largest amount of innovation in this country and the largest job growth. But uh, this bill gives them some degree of predictability on getting uh, the types of resources so they can innovate. So I really do applaud you, and I'm proud to be part of the committee, and this has been a very bipartisan bill, and I thank you, and I thank you for accommodating the amendment uh, that you were very helpful in getting passed initially along with Senator Snow that uh, increases the size of the surety bonds uh, from $2 million to $5 million, which really makes the difference for a small construction company being able to get government procurement. It's critically important. It's worked much more successfully than we thought when we first put this, the increase in effect. We've actually had a lot more contracts than we thought uh, when we originally suggested this. And I'm pleased to tell you it, it has no score as far as cost. So there's no taxpayer cost involved here. This really is a win-win situation to help small businesses be able to get the type of construction work adding to our economy and job growth. And uh, I look forward to uh, talking about this tomorrow, and hopefully we'll be able to get a vote. And I, again, thank you for your, your attention. And with that, Mr. President, I would yield the floor. Mr. President, I don't... Thank you. Mr. President, um, I'd like to speak just for two minutes in a general wrap-up. There may be other senators coming to the floor, and we're still in a period of morning business. But I'm hoping that we can get um, locked in a time to vote on the Cardin Amendment uh, number 240 and the Snow Amendment 253. There are other amendments that are a few amendments that are pending. Many others have been filed. And the senators are working together to see what kind of accommodations we can make. But again, I want to remind everyone, while we're working hard behind the scenes in many, many rooms and meetings today to try to keep our government open and operating while reducing spending where we can in an effective and a smart uh, and, uh, and constructive way, I want to remind our senators um, how important this bill is because it will be reauthorizing a program that actually is a program that creates jobs in America by the small businesses that are representative on all of our main streets in our states and our communities. This is the federal government's largest program for research and development. We don't believe 
that only big business, only international corporations have the best technology, the best approaches, or the best methods. We actually believe that there's small businesses, some quite tiny, some just one scientist and an assistant that can come up with cutting edge technologies or an engineer and an assistant or a doctor and an assistant that can come up with cutting edge technologies that can either cure the disease of the time or create a new um, mechanical system or a technology system that helps not only our federal agencies to cut spending, operate more efficiently, but can be commercialized in a way that creates manufacturing jobs and service jobs here in America. So there are many ways to get to a balanced budget, and we've heard a lot about cutting spending. Yes, we need to do that, but we also need to create jobs which generate income that close that budget gap. So if we can get a more robust economy underway, this program most certainly is one of the ones. I'm proud of the new economic data that's come out. We're not where we need to be, Mr. President. Unemployment is still too high, but it's coming down. We're not creating enough jobs, but we're creating more and more every month, and in large measure, it's because some of the work that our Committee on Small Business has done, both in the stimulus package, in our last small business bill to open up lending and get credit lines started in partnership with community banks, and part of it is smart programs like this. There are some government programs that don't work. This is not one of them. So I thank our uh, members for being patient. We now have the Cardin and Snow amendments at least pending. We'll hopefully lock in a time to vote on those and a few others that we're considering as well. And um, with that, I'll yield the floor. There may be other members that come down to talk in morning business. And tomorrow, hopefully, we'll start at an early hour and can continue to work on this important bill. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the floor. And I suggest the absence of a quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka.
Mr. Senator from Illinois. I ask the quorum call be suspended. Without objection. Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent that the Senate proceed to the immediate consideration of Senate Resolution 134 introduced earlier today. Clerk will report. Senate Resolution 134 supporting the designation of April as Parkinson's Awareness Month. Is there objection to proceeding to the measure? Seeing here no objection, the Senate will proceed. Mr. President, I further ask the resolution be agreed to, the preamble be agreed to, the motion to reconsider be laid upon the table with no intervening action or debate, that any statements relating to the measure be printed at the appropriate place in the record. Without objection. Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent that when the Senate completes its business today at recess until 10 a.m. on Thursday, April 7th, that following the prayer and pledge, the journal of proceedings be approved today. The time for the two leaders be reserved for their use later in the day. The Senate proceed to a period of morning business with senators permitted to speak therein for up to 10 minutes each, with the first hour equally divided and controlled between the two leaders of their designees, with the Republicans controlling the first 30 minutes and the majority controlling the second 30 minutes. Further, that Senator Holvin be recognized at noon for up to 25 minutes to deliver his maiden speech to the Senate. Without objection. Mr. President, we continue to work to complete action on the small business bill. We also hope to deal with this uh, continuing resolution by the end of the week. Senators will be notified when votes are scheduled. And Mr. President, if there's no further business to come before the Senate, I ask that it recess under the previous order. The Senate will be adjourned until recess until Thursday, 10 a.m., April 7th. The Senate's gaveled out, but it